Amen, amen, amen. Whew, just because he is. What a God, what an awesome God we serve. I'm so amazed about our God with every passing day and every passing week. And yes, music moves my heart more than sermons, I can tell you that. So, <clears throat> by the way, I'll talk more about this, but this bulletin is very important. You might want to read it before you leave today, otherwise you will miss important events. I'll talk about them at the end of my sermon, but please read it. There are sign-up sheets that are time-sensitive, so please do that. And by the way, I see a lot of new faces. Welcome to the Middletown Seventh-day Adventist Church, and those of you who are watching online, to welcome to our church here in beautiful, historic Middletown, Kentucky. Happy Sabbath to all of you and to all who are watching around the globe, including my family, if they do watch today. I want to start with a question today. Today's Sabbath, today weekend is special. If I were to ask you, what is your greatest need? Oh, is this working? No, the clicker doesn't work. Maybe. <clears throat> yes, if I were to ask you, what is your greatest need today? What could you answer? Food? Money, health, relationships. What is that we need most? What is our greatest need? And if you read the pastor's pen, you already know it. Ellen White in volume 1, page 120 of Selected Messages says... A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. And before her, King David, 2,700 years before her, King David wrote, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And David was called a man after God's own heart. Do you want to be a man or a woman after God's own heart? What does it take to be a man or a woman after God's own heart? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come to you once again this wonderful spring Sabbath morning to thank you for the greatness and awesomeness of your majesty and to be grateful for giving us a free space, giving us freedom to worship freely. And Lord, today we want to invite you to take over this message. It is important that we understand it and that we, we practice it. I pray, Lord, that you will double bless these words and bless the soil of our hearts to receive the seed of truth today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome back to the Life and Teaching of Jesus series here at Middletown Seventh-day Adventist Church. I am so excited to be studying the life of the one who gave it all for us and to learn from his stories and his parables. And this Sabbath, 
is the prayer and revival Sabbath here at Middletown. Almost 50 people signed up to pray around the clock since sundown last night till tonight at sundown. Isn't that amazing? And, and we will conclude our revival weekend with a sacred service tonight at 6.30. We will learn, we will pray, we will share testimony, and we'll fellowship together. So please plan to attend and be blessed. Life and teachings of Jesus. It is the theme of our study all of 2019. If revival is our greatest need, where else should I go? Who else should I learn from if not from Jesus? I outlined several reasons why we study the life and teachings of Jesus this year, all this year, in my first sermon. And I will keep mentioning two of them because I think they're very important. Uh, one is that we all want to be with Jesus in heaven, right? So then why not live and love like Jesus in 2019? So that's one reason. The other reason is we want to learn from the life and teachings of Jesus because we're Christians. And if we're truly Christians, we want to be like our master. We follow Christ. That's why we're called Christians. We want to be and we want to follow Jesus. And as Jesus was countercultural, we are also called to stand up for what is right, not to match the political, religious, or cultural standards around us. Just like Jesus did not conform to the standards of his world. Today, we will enter into the last week of Jesus' life here on earth and learn from one event that relates to our prayer and revival weekend. It is the week of the Passover. All Jews around the world, the ancient world, were coming to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. It is the festival that reminds every Jew of the miraculous deliverance from the Egyptian slavery. No Jew will forget that they were once slaves in Egypt. But what the problem was in those days, in their days, is what they missed, that there was a deliverer, with capital D, among them. One that was able to offer a much better deliverance, deliverance from the bondage of sin. His name is Jesus. So Jesus comes to Jerusalem that Sunday, and he is triumphantly received through the gates of Jerusalem. Jesus rides a donkey, and Matthew reports that story in Matthew 21, beginning with verse 7. <clears throat> he says, They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them, and a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the mul multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth, from Nazareth of Galilee. That was Sunday before his crucifixion. At the end of the day, Jesus went back and lodged with his friend, 
his best friend. By the way, do you know who his best friend was? Lazarus. Yes. He lodged with his friend Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary, in Bethany. In the morning, the following day, Jesus decides to go back to Jerusalem and go in the temple. It's really nice because next Sunday we have Easter. So this real guy goes right along with what's going on in the world, what we celebrate this week. So he looked around as he got into the temple. Ellen White describes that he looked and he looked and he looked. And everywhere he looked, there was something that pointed to his mission. Matthew chapter 21, verse 12 says this. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who brought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and seats of those who sold those. That was Jesus. What would you call that behavior? Recorded right there on this Bible verse. What would you call it? What would you call it? Why was Jesus angry? Right? Why was Jesus angry? You may say, Pastor Marius, it is because they were disrespectful of the house of God. Let me ask you this. Was it respectful, a respectful thing to change and exchange currency, to buy and sell animals, to make a profit and a business right there in the temple, in the house of God? Was it respectful? No. It wasn't. Maybe he was angry because they did not accept him as Messiah. You know, Jesus left the throne of the universe. Jesus left everything and even took human body for the rest of eternity. He will carry our human body. And he came to fulfill a mission that would give humanity a second chance. And he was the only one in the universe that could do this job. And the Jews not only didn't accept him as Messiah and as their Savior, but the Jews, the, the, Jews, the Jewish priests and rulers were looking for every opportunity to put him down, to take him out, to eventually kill him. Was that a reason for Jesus to be angry? Was Jesus angry because they did not receive him well when he came into the world? Think about it. After all, he was not born in China or America or Africa. He was born right there in Judea, according to the Bible prophecy foretold by the Jewish prophets. The very people who claimed to be waiting for the Messiah missed his birth. The very people who are supposed to be experts in Bible prophecy missed the fulfillment of prophecy under their own eyes, in their own territory, under their jurisdiction. Nobody had room for Mary and Joseph the night Jesus was born. Nobody seemed to care about the coming of the Prince of Peace and the Lord of Lords. Did that come to Jesus' mind when he drove them out of the temple? Why was Jesus angry? The first time we read about anger in the Bible is in, do you know where? Can you guess? Genesis chapter 4. Let's start with the beginning of the Bible. Oops. What? Yes, there's something here that I didn't get. Okay. What do we have in Genesis 1? In Genesis 1, we have the creation story. The six literal days of creation. And what do we have in Genesis 2? Genesis 2 
presents to us the end of the creation. It introduces the Sabbath, the seven-day Sabbath, and the formation and the institution of marriage. Eve was created in Genesis 2 and brought to Adam, thus the first marriage. Adam and Eve. And then comes Genesis 3. What do we have in Genesis 3? The story of the fall. That sad story when Eve and then Adam decided to doubt God and listen to the serpent. And they ended up stripped of God's glory. And not too long after that, they were removed from the, after they were removed from the Garden of Eden, they had two boys, remember? The first and the oldest was Cain, then Abel, the younger one. And Genesis chapter 4, that's where we're heading, relates the story of a jealous and insecure envious older brother Cain who gets angry with his brother in fact the Bible uses the word angry God asks him remember why are you angry with your brother and the story ends tragically with the first murder Cain is angry with his brother Abel and kills him. That's the first time we read of anger in the Bible. Why was Jesus angry? In the Old Testament, we read of stories when God's people get rebellious. And if it wasn't for Moses, God would have fill in the blank. God would have saved them. You know where I get that? From the Bible and from the spirit of prophecy. God's plan was always to save his people. In the New Testament, the Gospel of John chapter 2 verses 13 to 17 we have the first story of the cleansing of the temple three years before the incident we're talking today when Jesus was in Jerusalem during the Passover week again he enters the temple and he drives out the money changers and the rest of the business people who were desecrating God's temple now coming to our story in a crucifixion week. Why was Jesus upset the week he supposed to finish his mission on earth? What was he trying to do? Was he trying to kill them? No. That would defeat the purpose of his mission, right? I love the Gospel of Luke. Because it's written from a doctor's perspective. In the Gospel of Luke, we have, when you read the Gospel of Luke, you read the greatest amount, the greatest numbers of Jesus' miracles, healing miracles, that is. And there is a lot of compassion that Jesus shows or demonstrates towards people. This story of the second cleansing of the temple is recorded in Matthew 21, Mark 11, and Luke 19. It is found in all three synoptic gospels, but Luke, Luke adds a detail to the story that brings light to my question, why was Jesus angry? See, Jesus was well received in Jerusalem the day before, but today, the Monday of the crucifixion week, he goes on back to Jerusalem from Lazarus' home in Bethany, and as Jesus walks to Jerusalem, the Bible calls walks up, because he goes up in altitude, as Jesus walks up, he sees 
the city. Luke 19 verse 41 says, As he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, Jerusalem, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. What brings peace? Or better said, who brings peace? Who is the Prince of Peace? Jesus, right? But now, Jesus says, they are hidden from your eyes. I looked over and read some commentaries on Luke 19, 42. And commentators working on this word hidden say that Jesus had brought the good news for all the people, but most had refused to see it. Why was Jesus angry? Well, let me put it this way. Was Jesus angry? Even though many interpret Jesus' behavior in the temple, the temple as being angry, and sometimes those righteous people use anger to call it, hey, Jesus was angry too. Was Jesus angry? Based on Luke 19.41, was Jesus even angry? What do you think? From a counseling perspective, anger is rooted in fear and insecurity. It can also have its roots in guilt or it may rise out of grief. My question is, was Jesus insecure, faithful, guilty, or grieving? No. He is and was the Son of God. He had a mission, he knew it, and he knew what he was doing. What seems as Anger actually is not. You may suppose that he needed to raise his voice in order to be heard in that crowd, right? Ellen White has an interesting commentary on the event. In her book, The Desire of Ages, that is actually a, 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 an expository commentary on the life of Christ, Desire of Ages, pages 590 and 91, says this, again the piercing look of Jesus swept over the desecrated court of the temple. All eyes were turned toward him. Priest and ruler, Pharisee and Gentile looked with astonishment and awe upon him who stood before them with the majesty of, the, of heaven's king. Jesus just stepped into the room, overthrew the tables, said nothing. Those standing nearest him drew as far away as the crowd would permit. Except for a few of his disciples, the Savior stood alone. Look at this. Every sound hushed. The deep silence seemed unbearable. So, Did Jesus need to raise his voice? Jesus did not need to raise his voice because there was silence in the temple court. It was silence. Jesus was about to make a statement that is at the core of our revival weekend. He said, My house shall be called a house of praise. Is that what he said? My house shall be called a house of fellowship. Is that what he said? My house shall be called a house of preaching. Or studying. No. Jesus said, My house shall be called a house of prayer. 
My friends, that's why Jesus cleansed the temple. Because God's temple, His house, shall be called a house of prayer. Why prayer and not something else, you may say? In her little book, Steps to Christ, and I left it at home, I looked at it this morning. I love that little book. There is a chapter, chapter 11, dedicated, devoted solely to prayer. Title of that chapter is The Privilege of Prayer. On that chapter, on page 93, prayer is defined as the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Jesus called his disciples and he's calling you and me friends. John 15, verse 15, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus calls us his friends. And our prayers are the opening to God of our heart, of our mind, as to a friend. And if you have a good friend, a best friend, a reliable, trustworthy friend, you know what Jesus is talking about here. I have such a friend. I can call him and talk with him anything out of my mind and out of my life. If Jesus is our friend, we should be able to open our hearts to him and be completely honest and open with our Savior. And here is why prayer is so important and why it was so important for Jesus to make that statement in the temple. From the same page, page 93 on Steps to Christ, prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to him my friends Jesus wants you and me to be elevated at a higher level of life of spiritual life and that is only possible through prayer it brings us up to him prayer connects us with God in that same chapter chapter 15 of John where Jesus calls us friends earlier in that chapter he makes an important point and it relates directly to our objective for this revival weekend do you want to be revived then you need to be pruned into Christ you got to be connected to Jesus he said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. My friend, Jesus is your life. John 15, beginning with verse 4. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do how much? Nothing. My friends, when Jesus made that statement in the temple, he wanted people to realize that God is not interested in a ritualistic religion. He's not interested in offerings and sacrifices. In fact, Isaiah puts it very clearly. It says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. 
when you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. My friend, God is not interested in a theoretical, hypothetical religion, in an outward religion. He is rather interested in a personal relationship with his disciples. We are his disciples today. A personal connection that is fruitful, he said. A connection that can only be maintained through prayer. And then, as we open his word, as we pray, we pray our hearts to him, we open his word, he speaks to us the words of life. Would you be willing to stay connected with God through prayer? Would you commit to renew your prayer life today? Well, there are a few options that are available to you. One is for everyone, and it is personal. It's called pray without ceasing. When you wake up, when you drive down the road, when you stand in line at the grocery store, when you mow the grass, when you enter the church, pray for the leaders of the church, pray for the elders, the pastor, and our new members. Pray before you leave anywhere in your car. Pray after you arrive. Pray before your meals and pray before you lay down to sleep. Pray Pray, pray without ceasing. That's one option. Another option is pray at the prayer hour. Some of you may not know, and I want to bring this to your attention. Every Wednesday at 1 p.m., Naomi Oaks, who is our prayer ministry leader, conducts an hour of prayer right here in this very place. Come and pray together. There is power in praying together. There is something special about that. It unites us. It binds us. It connects us with God and with each other. If you're available, come and pray with us on Wednesday at 1. Now, there is another option that is convenient. It's now available to men. The reason it's available to men is because we started with Joshua's men. And uh, I believe there is a tremendous need in our society today for men, for godly men, I should say. And I know men are busy. Most men would probably not make it to the prayer hour. Joshua's men started praying together via teleconference. And would like to extend this option to all the men in the church. And I asked my deacons to have some slips of paper and you can share it with the, the men that would like to join us. All you need to do is to call a toll-free number, enter a code, and there you are. You joined us. You joined myself and the men praying together. Now, I would like to ask the men who would like to participate to raise their hand and the, the deacons will give it. So what I would like you to do if you want to participate in this is to write your name and, of course, your telephone number, because I'll send out text or email reminders. But I want you to name three uh, available times. Rank three options for you. See, as of now, we pray on Wednesday at 6 a.m. <laughs> uh, it is early, I know. But men are busy during the day, so I thought, well, but that was arbitrarily chosen by Joshua's men. Now, we'd like to extend this invitation to all the men in the church. And if you would rank your options, your available options, maybe Sunday, maybe at night, it may be, I, 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 I would, we would be more than happy to open more teleconference prayer, prayer teleconferences for our men. And if ladies are willing to do that, 
I'll pass on that information, and you can do that yourself too. The reason we do men and women sometimes, you know, is just one. So you don't want to, you know, we want to, you know, uh, avoid any any other thing. So we'll have men and women. Eventually, we can join in more things and have video conferences to just pray. So as you look at the sermon title today, in the bulletin today, what is every Christian's need? I think you know the answer. And if you don't know it yet, pray and listen again to our sermon today. May God bless Middletown with a spiritual revival through prayer. And hopefully we'll see you tonight.